town of the future cannot afford to overlook the lessons of the past. For, just as the past is still influencing us today, what we do now will influence the future of our communities. So let's just go over these lessons. The elements of the medieval town were man as a pedestrian, a pack horse, a sailing ship and the windmill, the castle, the cathedral and the burgher's house. It grew like a spider's web, a compact community closely related to its site with an identity of its own. The elements of the Georgian town were the, the classical temple church, the palace facade on a row of houses and the bridge. It was formally planned as a reaction to the eventual overcrowding of the medieval town. Its geometric precision was not very closely related to its site. It had qualities of space and proportion, but it brought the social division of the slum and suburb. The industrial town's elements were the industrialist, the worker, the mine, the steam engine, the factory, and the back-to-back. -back. The industrial town happened to meet industrial and not human requirements. Its growing sprawl all but obliterated its site. Commercial enterprise used the mechanical miracle exploiting humanity. Machine was put before man. The contemporary town adds the commuting office worker, the car, the underground, the suburban detached villa, the office block, the flat block and the maisonette. Its plan is a patchwork of the other three in general radial like the medieval town but not self-contained spreading out along its roads and railways until it's instead of town set in country the country becomes set in town a man who has spent his life thinking and writing about men and the kind of towns that they build is professor lewis mumford an american sociologist when he was over here last summer he talked to percy johnson marshall about some of the problems of our urban civilization. Tell me of the history of people and places. What do you consider to be the most useful lessons we can learn from the past in terms of town planning and architecture? Oh, there are so many useful lessons it would take as many days as we have minutes to go into all of them. But the main lessons for me are the lessons of continuity, uh, variety, and uh, personality. Uh, the need to the continuity is a very deep one in human life, and the city is an essential organ of this need. Take Damascus, for example. People have been living there for many thousands of years, and although it's been attacked and destroyed again and again, they're still living in the same place, carrying on life that originally began so far back. When I was in Athens a little while ago, I found myself wandering around the Agora and into a small uh, industrial district. Uh, workshops with potters and, and smiths doing very much the same work that Plato and Socrates beheld 500 years uh, before Christ. The other day in Piccadilly Circus, as I was walking around there, I remember that this was the site of St. James's Fair, with all its fun and frolic, and the same sort of activity that is going, uh, going on today in Piccadilly Circus as went on in the 17th century. This is an important element in human life which the city represents and carries for. Then there's variety. The city uh, is a place which uh, encompasses the utmost possible with human variety. And uh, along with continuity, therefore, goes always the possibility of changes taking place in the city more rapidly than ever before. Now, some of the things that the city carries forward, the streets, the squares, the the great public buildings are many thousands of year, years old. 
and they're still much the same as they originally were. There are others like a wall that are not just disappearing, but being transformed. The wall as a military barrier is gone, but the wall as in a horizontal form, which we call the green belt, is still with us, and in a much more pleasant <coughs> and effective form than the, uh, for our purposes, than the old wall could possibly have been. Uh, all these facts, facts of variety and continuity, lead to the final uh, the conception of the city as a, a representation of our collective personality. The city has character, and uh, we can't uh, alter the city in any way by so much as a single building without doing something either to represent or to, or to deface that character. This is a very important thing which we must be conscious of and which the study of historic buildings and the historic cities uh, makes uh, emphatically important. What new ideas have you seen recently for planning and building in our cities and towns that you think are the most useful for the present? On yesterday, most of them are at least a generation old, some of them a century old. Uh, the most important new idea, I think, uh, is an idea that everybody understands yet is the realization that the city is essentially a cellular structure, that you can't, a city is not just an indiscriminate collection of buildings, but it consists of precincts, of quarters, of neighborhoods, of zones, each of which has a characteristic set of activities, and which, in combination with the others, makes up the uh, living dynamic city, in which uh, everyone has a place to, uh, now, one of the chief examples of this is the British trading estate. The earliest trading estate possibly was an American one, but the best examples have been in Britain. Uh, the very, one of the very best uh, was one that uh, was built before the war in the Teen Valley, near, uh, near Newcastle. And I should say that this represents an important advance, which has been beautifully incorporated in the new towns. Incidentally, one of the very best of the early trading estates was in Letchworth Garden City, and the, the second one followed in Welland Garden City. And there's much to be said for having these individual precincts integrated in the town as a whole. The cellular structure, though, is uh, uh, that's one of the important ideas now coming in. Uh, the, the second important idea, it seems to me, one of uh, the most significant which has taken a long time to catch on in Britain, is the Radburn Plan. Now, the Radburn Plan is essentially a plan for making the town uh, adequate to, to use the motor cars without being overrun by them. It involves a complete separation of the precincts and residential quarters from the true motorways and the main traffic streets. Uh, the, the individual quarters of the city, the individual precincts, are uh, are uh, are in the lie are developed as as uh, units with uh, footpaths running through them and l lanes of access and in the case of Radburn green a uh, green park runs uh, through from one neighbourhood to another a long green strip uh, a further development of something that you had in Britain in Ladbroke Grove in London as far back as 1850. This is, this is a very important development. As I say, it hasn't caught on yet completely, but it's begun to catch on, even in Britain. The third, and here's where you take the lead, is the notion of the new town, the balanced community, of limited size, of limited area, surrounded by a green belt with adequate open spaces provided from the beginning, with all the zones uh, duly apportioned. This is a great concept at first, uh, was put forward by Ebenezer Howard in his concept of a garden city and uh, then was incorporated in Letchworth Garden City and later uh, in the 1920s in Welland. Now it's the basis of your new town's policy and nothing that has been done in town planning has had a, a more uh, decisive effect uh, upon the ideas of uh, people uh, then this notion of a balanced community, because the very notion of balance uh, restores something essential in the nature of the city that we've forgotten in our unbalanced, uh, uh, poorly developed uh, communities of the past. Uh, this is, this is a, a great contribution.
The balanced community as represented by the new town was an ideal of Ebenezer Howard. And 60 years later it is being generally applied. Now that's a long time, but it takes that long for theories to be generally accepted and put into practice. What other ideas have been produced in more recent times that could be applied to solve our present and future needs without waiting half a century? For our European situation, Le Corbusier, the great French architect of Swiss origin, has been the most prolific in writing and exhibiting and building for a machine age. He said the house is a machine to live in. Some of his critics can argue that he builds machines for machines to live in. His buildings are set off the ground, not on it, and his inhabitants have contact with nature by eye rather than by hand, as this sketch shows. In the 1920s, he produced the idea of the long, continuous block which has been used, as you saw, in the Park Hill estate in Sheffield. And much of the LCC's work is based on the ideas expressed in his Ville Radieuse of 1922. It is a city with industry, housing and offices separately zoned. And traffic is separated from pedestrians. Another new idea which is 40 years old. While the scheme has a high density in its continuous blocks of flats, only 12% of the ground is built on, leaving the rest for public open space. The idea of separating pedestrians and traffic is being applied in Britain now, in the Barbican scheme in the heart of the City of London. During the fire raids of 1941, the centre of the City of London was blasted and burned. Today, 20 years later, the area is still being rebuilt. Along London Wall, which runs below me here, now called Route 11, the office accommodation is going up. One building is finished and the others will soon be completed. the pedestrians will have their own level on a continuous deck where I am standing now. All the office entrances and the shops will be at this level too. And in this way, the relatively slow-moving pedestrian will be taken well away from the hazards of intermingling and mixing with the fast-moving vehicle. The residential zone, which balances the commercial one and which will bring a permanent population back to the city, has yet to be started. When the office workers flock back to their suburban, the business centres of our cities become dead. To counteract this and to provide homes on the spot, there will be accommodation for several thousand people on the site. With any luck, you will be able to see its housing, school, theatre and restaurants in use by 1971. The Barbican scheme resolves one small area of a city centre. Let's look at two other schemes proposed as the answer to replanning the whole of two existing capital cities, Berlin and Tokyo. For political reasons, Berlin is not a whole, and its most publicized recent building makes it look as if it never will be. The scheme for Tokyo is so radical and critical that the Japanese government banned the issue of the magazine in which it appeared. But that's just part of the architect and planner's life. What matters is that the ideas are put forward and publicized, for the sooner they are known, the sooner they are applied. An idea for Paris can apply to Sheffield. For the first, Berlin, we have a scheme submitted for the competition of 1958 by Wasserven, Osmond, Johnson Marshall and Buchanan. It is based on the realistic attitude of practical redevelopment of an existing site, 
of making use of sites as they become available until finally every piece fits into the overall framework. Each new building, as at the Barbican, would have its own piece of pedestrian deck ready to link up with the eventual overall deck. The main ideas for the overall plan are as follows. Within the overall traffic grid, giving one-way continuous flow with no crossing, each municipal unit is self-contained like a medieval township. The level below the pedestrian deck is for tra traffic circulation and servicing the buildings. In this way, the pedestrian never meets a bus or car unless he wants to get in or out of it. The level below that is for car parking and the underground system runs below that again. All these levels are connected vertically by one central shaft of lifts and escalators fed by travelators at the lower levels. All services, heating, lighting, water and so on, are provided centrally by the municipality, cutting out the waste and inefficiency of duplicating these services, supplying and maintaining them all. Each area has its own core of shopping, restaurants, a theatre or cinema, and again, as at Barbican, there will be housing to give continuous life to a predominantly business community. These core areas are linked to each other by pedestrian bridges over the traffic routes, giving a whole city of individual but related communities set around the other famous special areas of government, entertainment and learning. In this way there is a highly social human landscape for the inhabitants as they live and work in the city, while the roads bordered by Parkway have their own landscape acting as a green belt around each area of building. Tokyo, like London, has grown fantastically, particularly in the 20th century, radiate, radiating out along its roads and railways. It was this size in 1880 and this in 1953. It now has a population of 10 million. In the year 2000, it will be 25 million. Traffic problems for 10 million are immense. The problems for 25 on the same outdated traffic structure would be insoluble. Kenzo Tangi, a leading Japanese architect, has put forward this extraordinary scheme, scheme to solve the problems of moving people between work and home. His solution is a radically simple one. He escapes the suffocation of the existing city by building his new town like a bridge out over the shallow waters of Tokyo Bay. The corresponding industrial areas develop along the existing shore. The form of the new development is like a spine. A series of civic verte vertebrae make up this spine, each encircled by the multi-level communication system. Off this are ribs of residential areas. This model gives a closer look at three of these civic centres. Let's look at the communications first. The outermost road here is for 70 mile an hour traffic. Underneath it is another for 30 mile an hour traffic with monorail services and the lowest level here, inside, is for five mile an hour traffic. In this way, through traffic, local traffic, and domestic traffic are separately channeled. Each can get on with its own function without impeding the others. A series of frequent interchanges makes a step up or down from one type to another a controlled and easy maneuver. These three civic centers contain central entertainment facilities, cinemas, theatres and shopping, business and commercial enterprises in these offices, and educational facilities here, schools and colleges. These centres are continuous at ground level, 
making one common pedestrian park, bordered by water around the buildings and below the overhead roadways. The pedestrian is at the lowest level and the road at the top, a reversal of the Berlin scheme. A city with one centre, like London or New York, can only build upwards to increase its accommodation. And as you get nearer the centre, there are more and more vehicles on less and less road. Kenzo Tangi's scheme, being a linear development of interconnected centres, can always add another, with the road to go with it. So Corbusier's ideas of 40 years ago have been taken up and developed by Tangi. An idea for Paris can be applied to Tokyo. Tangi's scheme for Tokyo anticipates a population of 25 million in the year 2000. The present total world population of 3,000 million is expected to reach 4,000 million by 1980. After food, their major problem will be housing. Since the 1920s, an American engineer, Buckminster Fuller, has been developing a series of houses that could be industrially mass-produced like the motor car. The Wichita House of 1946 used materials so light that it could be delivered by air and assembled anywhere in the world. The whole shell of the house fits into the canister on the left. Each house has its own portable power unit and sewage disposable unit. The interior is arranged in this way. The hall, the living room, two bedrooms, with bathroom and kitchen in the centre. He next developed a way of putting the house unit under a geodesic dome of steel and plastic. Complete prefabricated domes can be placed by helicopter. Recently, thousands of paperboard geodesic domes were used for emergency housing of flood victims in Puerto Rico. With whole cities under domes, man could add artificial climate to artificial light. Take the whole city into space and all the inconveniences of topography could be eliminated too. But let's put our feet back on the ground and see what Professor Mumford has to say about the future. What kind of communities and homes do you hope to see created for tomorrow's living? Bearing in mind not only the possibilities created by new means of getting about, such as motor cars, helicopters, hovercraft, escalators, lifts, and moving walkways, but also the difficulties presented by the muddled state of our cities and towns today. Well, the muddled state of our towns today isn't say anything that we need to worry about if we have sufficient will to change them. The problem of getting through this muddle is an easy one. The will to get through it is another problem. We, had, we haven't yet developed sufficient understanding of the possibilities of city life. Uh, to create the popular desire for a different kind of city than that that people are used, uh, used to now. As for the matter of the new means of transportation, I don't regard that as a controlling element of the development of the city. The city of the future is essentially a human institution to which mechanical means, like those we were talking about uh, recently, are, are subordinate. And uh, either city of the future, as I conceive it, uh, the ideal city would be a city which is planned in order to make possible the best, uh, uh, the best development of each phase of life, from childhood right on to old age. Uh, the architect and the community planner would be thinking not of the building, not of the, uh, the machine, not of the abstract structure, He'd be thinking of the human being and uh, what he requires at every moment of, its of his development. Uh, when I was over here after the war, I suggested to the planners that the plan the neighborhood was the uh, housewife going to market, uh, rolling a pram as the creature whom they had to please and uh, make uh, a walk entertaining. And that applies to the development of the rest of the city. It's absurd, for example. Uh, to put up a 15-story flat uh, for people with children and uh, to create a problem in child care, looking at it, which is almost impossible for a busy mother to, uh, to surmount. Uh, it's necessary for there to be a close relation for, between a parent and child. There can't possibly be if the parent lives in an upper story of a building and the poor child is either confined to the flat 
or has to wander alone in the bleak playground or open space down below. So I consider the whole the community as a whole must cover the whole spectrum of human activities. Uh, the suburb is an inadequate community because it only covers a very small uh, phase of human life. Uh, so any specialized community is too narrow to encompass the human development, uh, either biologically or spiritually. What we want, and this is the great benefit that the big city gives, is a uh, kind of community which is sufficiently balanced uh, to do justice to the political, the religious, the social, the economic uh, aspects of a person's life, to make every moment of a living uh, an educative activity. Because we are very close to solving the great industrial problems of production, but we haven't yet discovered what to do with our time once we have, uh, our solution has become a universal one. Uh, the city of the future, the community of the future, will be planned around the function of education as the most important aspect of living. It will consider that human life is essentially for that purpose, not for the purpose of producing more goods uh, in order to uh, expand industry and uh, produce more profits. The human element will be in control of uh, every aspect of the city's development. At the moment, the human element is not in control. The way to this ideal is through education education of the citizens to understand their town's problems and ideals. The great sociologist Patrick Geddes, with the Outlook Tower in Edinburgh, started an idea which Philadelphia has adopted. The town as it is, and as it could be, is seen in this model on permanent exhibition to the whole populace. Each section of the town shown as it is at present turns over to show the future possibilities. Proposals for new buildings and roadways are thus on display for anyone to see in their own context, the citizens' own town. The town's form is not just the architect's and planner's responsibility. For consciously or not, everyone is part architect of his own community. In this series, we've tried to show you the growth of your own town. For what has happened to York, Edinburgh, Oldham and London has happened to some degree to every town, for better and worse. We've done this in the hope that you can use this knowledge to see that the mistakes of the past are not repeated and to see that ideals are given a fair hearing and that idealism does not succumb to expediency. Goodbye.